Yeah, uh, let me be a little apologetic about raising this question. It seems to me that we've all uh, loved to play with AI ideas, and philosophers usually uh, play in a very abstract uh, sandbox. And here we are, and even before this year, we are suddenly faced with a, a kind of a raw reality that is happening on the ground even as we speak. So all the theoretical, playful, and uh, gee whiz, uh, fun stuff uh, has suddenly become very, very serious. So all these questions that we love to talk about in the abstract have suddenly become very concrete. Now, in your talk with Dan Dennett, and which I enjoyed very much, by the way, he takes the most serious position of all. As far as I can tell, he's basically saying that anytime you have a conscious I'm, I use the word conscious in quotes because I don't think AI is really conscious and I can go into that, but that's not really relevant to the meaty part of our discussion here. And Dan was basically saying there are certain things that you just have to outlaw, and one of them is a counterfeit AI that's the same one that appears to be a human, which is not surrounded by the network of trusts and obligations that every normal human being is surrounded by. And he points out the similarity uh, with money, for example, because money uh, functions only as a result of trust. There's nothing inherent uh, about dollar bills. There's nothing inherent about what were the shells that people used in South in, in, in Africa a couple hundred thousand years ago as a medium of exchange. There's nothing inherent about barter, for that matter. If you sell your roasted chicken to your neighbor in exchange for a beautiful song or a beautiful uh, necklace, which people do all the time uh, in tribal circumstances. There's nothing beyond trust and appreciation, if you like, uh, of the result or the avoidance of a negative result. And uh, that's the bottom line on a human basis. But of course, that doesn't apply to AI necessarily because AI is not born uh, to a mother. It doesn't uh, grow up from the most basic state of helplessness, totally dependent on the surrounding caregivers, and emerge out of that human womb, if you like, I mean the social womb, in addition to the individual womb of the mother. So we are unconsciously, most of us, constrained in all kinds of ways. And Dan points out, basically, that that is simply not true of AI imitations of human beings, which are so seductive and which persuade so many of us that they are essentially human. So Dan is essentially saying we should treat human-like AI uh, as counterfeits, the same way we treat uh, counterfeit money, for example, and very rigorously rule it out which would mean that taking all the uh, automatic weapons on the battlefield in the Ukraine right now and stamping it with some, some stamp of prohibition that says, thou shalt not tamper with human robots, human-like robots. Now, I'm stating this strongly because I think that's what Dan is saying, and you can correct me, of course, if that's not correct. But he's, he's taking this very seriously, and I think that's an important thing to consider. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are taking the risks of AI quite seriously, Dan being just one of them. I mean, but I do think that the issue that we discuss in our interview, you know, for the Center of Future, the Future Mind, right. which people can get, by the way, on uh, YouTube, it's available, we have a YouTube channel, was Interesting. Um, and I think he, Google followed up on that as well. Um, so here's the context for that. Because I think, again, I don't want to go from yes, to autonomous weapons because I think the situations are different. So we've got these large language models like 
Lambda, Google's Lambda system, and now they're right. building Palm, which has even more parameters. And I think a lot of people have been playing around with chat GPT-3. And, you know, people are, I think, commonly coming to recognize how the interaction with the uh, chatbots is becoming more believable by the month. Right, Rachel? I mean, jump in anytime, Rachel, because you're the expert here on these large language models. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And so when you're talking with, say, Lambda, one thing that comes up is it's a bullshit artist, to be frank. It occupies different perspectives depending on the conversational context. So you can ask it if it's sentient. It'll say yes. Should it have rights? Yes. And, but then two minutes later, it'll give a different answer and it'll occupy the perspective, not of a person, but of a planet, um, you know, uh -huh. anything. So, you know, and the problem here is that Google was trying to make an exciting, entertaining chat bot. And they right. probably didn't think through the repercussions, you know, which is that, is it right to impersonate a sentient being or a human? And of course, there's other issues that come out of this, as we saw with Blake Lemoyne claiming that Lambda was conscious. I think there's a big question here of how we can even recognize when a system is conscious or not. And I wanted to make sure that today we, we discuss some of those issues because I'm keen to discuss global workspace in relation to them. Oh, sure. You know, yes. but I think Dan's right that he used the example of a watermark, right? To stop right. counterfeiting. And so a digital watermark, if you will, that allows people to understand that they're interacting with a robot. Right. Um, I think this is a good strategy. Now, see, but again, you know, I'm not making a claim that in the defense arena, this very same strategy needs to be used. Here I'm talking about public uses of AI services, right? Because I actually think if you send a robot in to do a, something a soldier is about to do and it can impersonate a soldier, it can save lives. Or, I mean, there's the other side of the coin, it which certainly is could, it yes. could also cause the production of yet more robots and an arms race of AI. So, I, I, But those are different issues, I think, right? But oh, Dan was approaching yes. the counterfeiting AI issue in the context of these Lambda systems. Rachel, do you, do you have anything you want to add on these points? Yeah, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff too, because I think, like you said, Susan, an arms race for AI is, is kind of what we're walking into if we're not already in it. I'm skeptical of the idea from proposed by Dan Dennett and others of monitoring or trying to safeguard these maybe counterfeit AI systems that we don't quite have, but are getting dangerously close to with things like chat GPT, as you said, Susan. Um, I'm skeptical because it's not an, I don't see it as an AI related issue. I see it as a like human social issue that we've come up against many, many times. Like we have the same problem in nuclear warfare just because we decide that we're not going to have autonomous weapon systems or that we're not going to make a super intelligence doesn't mean that someone else on the planet isn't going to do that. So we will probably end up making one just because someone else is making one. Um, it's the good actor, bad actor problem, right? Which I think is an appropriate rationale for behind why you should make one of those systems in the first place. And we have the same issue with gun control and and uh, drugs and stuff like that. Is is how do you how do you take something that's potentially dangerous and also potentially helpful, and how do you integrate that into society in a way that minimizes potential harm? And traditionally, it, like depending on the issue, that's why I brought up gun control and things like that. Depending on the issue, regulation can or cannot help, and it depends on your stance on those issues, how you'll feel about it. But but I think this issue of, of how do you deal with AIs that are potentially impersonating people and maybe duping the public or uh, those who are less familiar with the inner workings of the AI is really difficult to control. And I don't have any good answers or solutions to that. I wish I did. Uh, I think 
the other question that you brought up, Susan, which is really interesting, is if you built an AI that was not working how the human brain works at all, right? But it was able to appear like a human, sort of like a really, really fancy Las Vegas magic trick, right? And if you're the developer, the engineer that made this system, you know for sure that this is not a real AGI or a real human-like AI, but it looks like it. It's like a slide of the hand. It's a magic trick. So it looks like it is to the untrained eye, right? So how how is that? Like, my question is, is that is that sufficient for calling it conscious or whatever? Like, if we can't disprove it and the majority of the public seems to think that it is the real thing, then how is it that well, much different? Uh, from a scientific point of view, uh, this is a trivial problem. It's not particularly interesting, actually, the fact that you have some... Uh, some machine that imitates the behavior of human beings. It's a feat, you know, it's an achievement of a kind. But consciousness is a biological entity and has an enormous evolutionary history, of course. Uh, if, if you take the cortex as a kind of a s index of consciousness, which you can certainly in among mammals, basically all mammals that have cortex are conscious, they're not quite conscious the same way human beings are. Aristotle was right on that point. But Aristotle also thought that animals had sensory consciousness, if I'm correct on that. And Susan, you might want to check me on that since you're the philosopher here. So it's trivially easy from a scientific point of view to distinguish between AI and, and a human consciousness because human beings not only have... Uh, let's call it 200,000 years of hominid evolution uh, that give rise to our particular variety of mammalian brains. But we also have 200 million years of mammalian evolution that precedes that. And if we bother to go earlier than that, uh, I, I've been very skeptical about this until I started to talk to biologists, by the way, who have been thinking about this for a long, long time without ever wanting to really say it. But I got to know Walter Freeman, and I got to know Jerry Ellerman and, and many other biologists who simply pointed out that in terms of comparative biology, uh, consciousness is, can't be something new. Or you can simplify that question by asking yourself, is waking uh, something new in animal evolution? And the answer is obviously not. All animals, certainly all land-dwelling animals, uh, have waking and sleep sleeping periods. Uh, some of the sea mammals, like uh, cetaceans, can sleep one hemisphere at a time, which is a very good trick, uh, especially if you need to keep breathing. But that's, uh, that is an interesting adaptation in the marine environment. If we limit ourselves to terrestrial uh, animals, Essentially, uh, they are all, uh, all the vertebrates, let's say, to keep it within bounds, all the vertebrates are conscious. And that biological history is expressed in your body and my body, your thoughts in this very second, and my thoughts in this very second. So scientifically, the, the question about uh, faking consciousness uh, via computers is actually quite trivial. It's, it's interesting, but it's, but it's not scientifically deep. 